Hi everyone, I'm John Lolito. I'm the team leader for insect and plant propagation here at BASF Agricultural Solutions. I'm an entomologist by trade, and today I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I came to be an entomologist. So what is entomology, you might wonder? Entomology is the study of insects, and this can broadly encompass any topic that concerns insects, whether it's the behavior, the physiology, or the interaction of that insect with any number of other things. People, our crops, our, our homes, our health, all of those things. So I became interested in entomology at a very, very young age. I'm, I'm sure my parents could tell you better stories than I could, but I have always been one of these types of folks that just, you know, I've got you know, plastic vials in the pocket. Wherever I go, I find some insect, I collect it, I want to study it, I want to learn about it. You know, insects are a great model system for so many things, and so this interest has allowed me to look at insect behavior. It has allowed me to look at the control of pests. It has allowed me to look at how insects evolve and how they see and perceive the world. So to become an entomologist, one might need varying levels of education. So my personal pathway was that I earned a bachelor's in biology, followed by a master's in biology, where I specifically began to study insect behavior. And then I went on to earn a PhD, looking at insect behavior in the field and how that might apply to the control of an exotic species. So my career path as an entomologist, um, I would have to say I've been very lucky. Um, I had a, a series of very good mentors along the way that encouraged my love and passion for insects and also helped me to take that passion and apply it to topics or subjects that had real world impact. And I think this has helped me along the way in, in so many ways. You know, when you're a scientist, an entomologist, it isn't just about the science that you do, it's also about how you communicate it and how you share that knowledge with others. And for example, you know, uh, one of the ways that you communicate is you publish papers or you give presentations. And I was able to have all of those experiences early on in my education. This was very important because it set the stage for me to, to have those skills, the communication skills, the presentation skills, knowing how to interact with others, and to take potentially complex scientific topics and make them accessible to everyone, whether that was, you know, a kindergarten class who wants to learn about monarch butterflies or you know, a set of professors to which I had to defend a paper, for example. So later, after earning my degrees, I was able to get a very good start to my career. I went to the USDA, so at the time, when I was working on my PhD, I was able to meet a lot of colleagues through the USDA research that I was doing. And some of these are still wonderful colleagues that I still talk to today at meetings and such. And this networking, and the networking is another important skill, uh, led me to an opportunity to manage a biological control facility for USDA APHIS. So I went from being a PhD student to actually managing this facility, and my previous experiences helped me there as well. So when you're a graduate student, the focus is often very much on publications and grant writing and these types of things. And it became very obvious to me when I went to become the facility manager for USDA that those were important skills, but that there were many others that I had to develop very quickly. So managing people is not an experience that many people have in graduate school. If you can get that experience, you should. It becomes very important. Many scientists at some point in the career will have to manage someone else, whether that's one or two technicians or uh, you know, uh, potentially an entire group of people. It's very important to hone those skills. You have to understand how to interact with others. You have to understand how to explain complicated topics in a way that you know, isn't complicated because not everyone that you interact with is going to be an entomologist. And so this time at USDA was really valuable for me to develop those skills. And it prepared me to make the move to BASF, where I now have a similar, if not even more complex role. And so I still have all of the people management. I serve as an expert within the organization. And so this varies from the fun and entertaining, what I like to think of as the mystery cup, which means I go into my office in the morning and there's some nondescript plastic container with a mystery insect inside and there's some kind of hastily written note that says scary thing found under bed what is it and it's great when there's a name or an email attached to that and i know who to get a hold of all the way through from that type of activity to you know designing and managing the facility so you have to understand 
you know, I do insect mass rearing, and so this means I have to know a lot about, you know, uh, lighting systems and heating, ventilation, air conditioning, things like this. You have to understand a lot of chemistry because you need to understand how insect diets are put together, for example. These are often very complex food items that have dozens or more ingredients, and you need to understand how those different chemistries will interact. It's also helpful to understand insect behavior um, because knowing how to mass produce an insect is often predicated on the idea that you know what the animal would do in the real environment and how to bring that behavior and to bring you know, that way of living from the ins insect's perspective into the laboratory. There are many career paths available to an entomologist, so my career path is not the only one. Uh, many people in entomology are uh, pest control operators of one sort or another. So these are the people that you might call to deal with termites or roaches in the home. Other entomologists serve you know, in our military. They may be medical entomologists that help to protect people when we travel overseas to accomplish the various roles and missions uh, there. There may be some pure research, right? So research into insects for the sake of understanding more about these, these animals and the way they interact with plants and the soil and the environment. Um, a lot of entomologists work in some way or other for some form of industry. So, you know, uh, research and development around topics that concern, you know, crop protection or the protection of our health or our homes. Uh, really, insects touch our lives in a lot of ways every day. And any one of those ways that you can think of, if you think about your day from the time you get up until the time you go to sleep, somewhere in there you have likely interacted with an insect, even if it was only to go, ooh, I want to get away from that insect. Somewhere along the line, somebody had to study that insect. And so really anything that falls under that umbrella really is what it is to be an entomologist. An entomologist really needs to have a broad skill set, especially where we're concerned about educating others about insects. Insects are something that a lot of people, they're, they're kind of opaque, right? So you see a lot of carpenter ants coming out of your cupboard and you don't understand necessarily what they're doing or what's going on or whether or not your house is infested. And so an entomologist called in to assess that situation needs to be you know, calm and collected and a good communicator. Oftentimes when people have to interact with a lot of insects, especially where that interaction is, let's say, you know, negative, there is a pest problem. The people have a lot of energy, right? They have a strong feeling about how they don't want any more roaches under their refrigerator. They don't want termites, you know, eating their garage. And so you really have to understand the emotions of the person you're talking to. You also have to understand how to take something complicated, like for example, the nesting biology of a carpenter ant, and explain it to the homeowner in a way that helps them to understand that, you know, the 500 ants coming out of their pantry are unlikely to be destroying their house, are actually likely to be nesting somewhere else on the property, and so, you know, making sure that you have that interaction where you help them to understand that yes sure i can fumigate your your pantry but that isn't actually going to solve the problem because the real carpenter ant nest where the queen and where the eggs and where all of these delightful little animals came from is in your firewood pile 200 feet away from your house and so being able to know okay so you know the, the science behind what you're doing being able to communicate that to someone who doesn't know the science is is so incredibly important and especially when you think about the diversity of the audiences that you might, you might talk to. So for example, in the regular parts of my job, I would talk to you know, school children, I would talk to middle schoolers, high schoolers, I would talk to college students or adult professionals about any number of topics. And obviously, you cannot give the same lecture to the kindergartners that you would give to you know, a group of board certified entomologists. The one wouldn't understand it and the other one would be bored to tears. And so you have to find ways of taking that topic and really molding it. So you need to understand, you know, presentation and, 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 you know, people who become entomologists often have a lot of passion. And so I would say to keep that passion and to use it, leverage it as a way to get other people excited about insects. BASF takes sustainability very seriously. And, you know, expert entomologists are a big part of that sustainability mission. We do a lot in the community to help people to understand that, that, you know, and actually the most important thing is that most insects are not pests, right? So when we go out and we, we talk to people, um, for example, we talk a lot about our monarch challenge, right? So we all know the monarch butterfly. Uh, this animal, the, the caterpillar feeds on milkweed. Milkweed is in decline. And so 
what can we do about that as a society? What can we do about that as individuals, right? So making those decisions and helping educate people is a big part of that role. And you have to really, you know, understand the issues at play, right? There are many forces that go into what becomes a sustainable thing, right? Is it sustainable to simply say, okay, we won't cut down any more milkweed, or is it more sustainable to say, this is where we will have milkweed and this is where we will not? You know, as an example, I allow some milkweed to grow in my garden. And every year, and in fact now, I'm, I'm certain there are monarch eggs and caterpillars in there as they begin to get ready for the fall migration. And, you know, really understanding the scales at which that sustainability can apply. If, if everyone contributes a little bit, you can accomplish a much larger goal than if you simply say, okay, we're gonna do this over here and call it sustainable. But really, sustainability is a community effort. And I think it's very important that not only entomologists, but also all scientists participate in that effort to help the community do what is the most sustainable. My career advice to any young entomologist watching this video is, you know, follow your passion. I was encouraged, even at a very early, you know, young age by my family, you know, to follow that passion. And I think this is really important because people tend to excel at what they are passionate about. Passion is a tremendous amount of energy, and if you're really passionate about a subject, if you really are the kind of kid I was, where you would be, you know, in the bushes collecting things and, and, and you know, writing down the life cycles and all these things, um, take that, harness it, right? Because this energy is something that others appreciate about any subject matter expert, right? Whether you want to be an entomologist or a physical therapist or a chemist or an airline pilot, if you're really excited about what you do, that energy will inspire others, right? And, and it really makes your role so much easier. As an entomologist, you know, when I get the mystery cup, like I mentioned, this is not something that's a drag on my day. This is interesting. This, you know, sort of ignites that energy. And so I'm always very happy to help others learn about this, you know, strange spider they found under the deck or whatever the case might be. And so I think that really is the most core piece of advice is to just maintain that passion and use it. You know, find societies, join your local entomology society, participate in, you know, Facebook groups that might be concerned with specific topics. Like we have one for the Monarch Challenge, but there are so many others that, that are all equally valuable, right? And so maybe you're really interested in ants. There's a forum for that. Maybe you're really interested in butterflies. There's a forum for that. Leverage the passion and continue to pursue the interests because one thing I can tell you from my career path is uh, you will never learn everything you need to know from one source, right? You will not have one book or one experience or, or even one mentor who teaches you everything you need to know to be successful. The more you can learn and from the more people you can learn, the more successful you will be. And when a lot of passionate people, a lot of passionate entomologists get together, this is an exponential effect. And I think it's very beneficial, especially for folks early in the career, to participate in as many different kinds of activities as they can so that they really learn about the thing they have passion for. It will inspire you to continue down that path and make you the best entomologist you could be. Entomology, to some folks, might seem like, okay, well, why are, we, why are we studying all these insects? Well, when you think about how many insects there are on this planet, you know, as the human population grows, it becomes even more important that we understand all those insects. The more of us there are, uh, the more of us there we have to feed, for example, and insects they take an awful lot of our food, right? From the time that the seed hits the dirt. There are things trying to eat that seed before it even grows into a seedling. There are things that try to eat the plant as it grows. There are things that try to eat the fruit of that plant, whether it's a ear of corn or an apple or a peach or a whatever. There is some kind of an insect that's trying to get that away from the farmer and eat it for itself, right? And so if we're truly gonna be sustainable and truly feed our growing human population, we need to understand how to keep those insects out of that food source. You know, we also spend a lot of effort, you know, I'm a gardener and I like my garden to be just so, and I imagine that, that many people like their lawns and their gardens and, and also their homes, right, to, to look the way they are. And so if your rose bush is full of aphids and your house is full of termites, we haven't met that condition, right? And so entomology, as a science, entomologists, as scientists, we provide that link, right? We help to understand both the insects as they are and how we can successfully interact with them as a human population. So, you know, we don't necessarily, we cannot exclude them from everything we do, but we can come to some balance where we have the food we need to feed the world and we have, you know, our health and our safety is preserved. 
and our, you know, the gardens look the way we want them to, our orchards grow the way we want them to, our homes are secure from pests. Our stored food is secure, you know. We talked a little bit about, you know, all of these different aspects of what it means to be an entomologist, and all of those apply equally to helping the world deal with the insects that we share our planet with. Um, I think that's a very important topic, and I would encourage everyone to understand a little bit more about these insects. Thank you very much for joining us today as we celebrate Bugfest, our virtual infestation. I hope you've enjoyed these segments, and I hope that you will tune in for more of our Bugfest activities from September 14th to the 19th. All right. Awesome. So I know I have a ton of questions, but first of all, I need to introduce our um, live in-person special guest, John Lolito from BASF. Hi, John. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks for watching my, my nice long video there. So, so I am um, an expert in, sorry. Yeah, go, yeah, go for it. I was gonna say, please tell us a little bit more about, um, about you and uh, yeah, what you're doing right now. Sure. <laughs> uh, well, you know, sitting on Zoom, which is, uh, you know, a, a somewhat strange thing that we seem to be doing a lot of in 2020 for whatever reasons. But um, so I'm an expert entomologist at BASF, like I mentioned in the video. And so I, I manage a team. As I mentioned, I have uh, 10 folks uh, that report to me. I have somewhere between, I was actually just trying to think about it in my head, somewhere between 16, maybe 17,000 square feet of greenhouse and lab space that I oversee. So I talked a little bit about the HVAC and all this stuff. So you have to be a bit of an engineer to do what I do. But but my laboratory, my team, you know, we produce together about 40 million insects a year. So for those of you who might be watching who think about, you know, one or two insects and go, you know, ooh, that's interesting. Um, imagine, you know, tens of millions of these animals. And, and that's my job. That's what I do every day. So that's pretty fun, I think. So what's more difficult, managing the 16 people or the 40 million insects? <laughs> well, it's really hard to pull those two apart, right? So, so um, both, right? So some insects are really complicated. Some people are really complicated. They're actually not so different than us in a lot of ways. Um, there, are, there are people and insects that are easy to deal with every day. You look forward to seeing them in the hallway or, well, I guess in the garden if it's the insect. Uh, people don't pop up in the garden as often as they used to this year. Um, and, you know, there are other ones that, you know, you, you kind of, oh, boy, it's that favorite coworker, it's that favorite insect, you know, the mosquito is coming to bite you again. Yeah, there's both. Yeah, so speaking of kind of uh, um, more difficult coworkers to work with, what is the most difficult insect that you um, rear um, at BASF? The most difficult? Um, well, that's a good question. So we have we have some beetles that we work with, and it's not necessarily that the beetle is difficult. Like the individual little guy is is cute and fuzzy, and it's a nice beetle. And you know, I I, I get to know them. I name them. We feed them. We have breakfast together some mornings. But the process of turning these these animals into more more animals, right? That's the hard part. So. So some insects, you know, so for an example, right now in, in the daytime or in the evening, you guys might hear cicadas outside, right? And so cicadas are, you know, they seem like they come out every year, but that individual cicada actually spent, you know, a number of years growing. And so some insects are tough because their life cycles are really, really long, right? They spend a lot of time, months, years, many years in some cases, doing something sort of cryptic underground. So cicadas live on tree roots and they only come out when they're done feeding on tree roots after many years. And so you get the cicada, but then it's a lot of years later until you get more cicadas. And so that's, that's challenging. We have some species like that, you know, they're not all like fruit flies. I, I heard Miranda mention fruit flies where, you know, we all probably know that the, you know, the life cycle is really fast, right? You leave a banana on the counter and before you blink three times, it seems like there's fruit flies coming out of the thing. But some insects have many years of a life cycle and these are probably the most challenging to deal with. And some of them are actually very economically important. So that's a, one we're interested in. Yeah, so um, kind of on the same same line of thinking, um, Amber wants to know what are some insects that you enjoy focusing on the most? I guess what are your kind of favorite ones that you walk in and, and say, yes, I get to work with, with these guys today? Yeah, my favorite ones when I walk in. I actually really enjoy, we have some, some grasshoppers, right? And so these are fairly large grasshoppers. I think one of the 
video shorts that will be part of this bug fest actually shows me, you know, interacting with some of these grasshoppers. And they're really big. They're several inches long. They're called lubber grasshoppers. And we use them as a model system for a number of things. And they're just really cool. I mean, they're, you know, they're enormous. They have personality. They love honey nut Cheerios. If you have a honey nut Cheerio, you can have the grasshopper on your hand and you can feed the Cheerio. I don't know why they like those, but they do. And they'll sit still and eat one for five minutes. So it's kind of cool, especially if you have, you know, a coworker or a neighbor that kind of, you know, gives you the eyebrow if you have an insect on you. That's a fun, that's a fun trick, especially for Halloween. <laughs> yeah. And, and I know, like, I just love watching tiny animals eat things, you know, um, <laughs> and and of course, like honey nut Cheerio. I, I agree that honey nut Cheerio is probably the best tasting Cheerio. So um, I, I can agree with the the lovers there. Um, and so you know, going back to to kind of your career at BASF, why Karen friend Karen wants to know um, why do you breed and raise insects, and what do you do with them once you raise them? Well, so so. Why do we breed them? Let's start there. Um, we breed them because at BASF, we develop a lot of biological and chemical solutions for various pest problems, right? Whether that's to, you know, for example, treat the litter in chicken houses for, you know, pests or to, you know, treat the concrete under your house for termites or whatever, right? We, we need to understand how those, you know, those products work. And, and that R&D process is really long. It's, it's 15 or 20 years in some cases. And so, my insects, you know, their first purpose is for research and development. And so to get there, what do we do with them? Um, a lot of them actually, so, so think about this sort of like, um, it, it's really like farming, right? Because we, we grow a bunch of insects and some of them we have to keep back, right? This is, our, this is our breeding herd, so to speak, right? To get more cows, you have to keep some cows and let them, you know, make calves and yada yada. So we keep a certain portion of the insects we rear to make more insects later. And then the other insects that we have are given to our scientists to do, you know, the various laboratory greenhouse or field trials, uh, you know, and all sorts of things in between that. Um, and that's when I say, you know, 35 to 40 million insects, that's only the insects that we would deliver to, you know, our field biologists or, or our chemists in the greenhouse or whatever else. That doesn't even count the breeding herd. So it's actually so many more insects than that, uncountable numbers of them. So interesting. I can't imagine just like going in and seeing that many insects every day. <laughs> and of course, lots of them are very, very tiny, right? Well, yeah, sure. Okay. So, so there are things like aphids that are like, you know, one millimeter long that don't look very impressive when they're in quantities of five or 10 or 12 or, or even several hundred, right? But when you're, you know, for example, a farmer and you have, you know, many, many acres of a crop and every, every acre has who knows how many tens of thousands of plants and every plant has a thousand aphids. Well, now it's impressive, right? Because you're talking about billions of insects and people react to that kind of thing. They, they see that and they realize they have a problem. Right. You typically want to deal with the insects before there's billions, then you're not going to win so easily. <laughs> yes. I've, um, I'm one of the people who have kind of gotten into um, the quarantine house plant um, trend. And so uh, I brought a plant in and it was, it was great when I brought it. And it's so it's like suddenly started like not doing so well. And I'm just like spider mites. It has spider mites. I know. So I'm looking for all the signs of it. So I think we all have experiences with like those kind of panic moments of like this thing is dying and it's something tiny and I can't see it. But um, anyway, um, something that I know probably a lot of people will hear would love to hear about. And it's something that during our past bug fest events um, you've, talked about and it's monarch butterflies. And so Mark wants to um, hear more about the monarch butterfly program that you um, guys have at BASF. And um, and how can, you know, we all help um, with, you know, the monarch and why should we care? Why are monarchs cool? Okay, well, let's start with why they're cool. Um, <laughs> it's a four inch bright orange butterfly. If that's not cool, then I don't know how to impress you further from this point. Um, and, and the fact is that the life cycle of the animal is just really unique, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of butterflies out there. Um, there's a lot of different species depending on where you live, you know, in the U.S. Or, or even globally. But monarchs, you know, for me, one of the most interesting things is their migration pattern, right? So, so these animals, that the monarchs that you see in the garden now, so I'm in, you know, 
Raleigh, North Carolina, and, you know, I have monarch caterpillars and I have some adults, and these animals soon are going to go south, right? And they'll make the attempt at least to go to Mexico. And, and how do they do that? I mean, if I had my, okay, maybe I'm not, you know, 18 anymore, but if I have my iPhone, I'm lucky if I can, you know, navigate around the county or the state, and, and these animals don't have an iPhone, and yet they sort of understand by where the sun is in the sky and the time of day it is how to go to a place they've never been before, that's 3,000 miles away. I think that's a pretty impressive trick for an insect, personally. I couldn't do it myself, even if I had the iPhone, probably. Um, and so, so what do we do about monarchs? And so, so BASF, you know, we, we work with a lot of farmers. And farmers, um, in a lot of cases, have a lot of land, right? And so, so I have some milkweed in my garden. I probably have, you know, a couple hundred milkweed plants all told on my little tiny, you know, suburban square. But when you think about a farmer and how they might have acres and acres and acres of land, the, the number of milkweed plants that a farmer could grow on average is so much larger than what any one of us could do, right? Even if me and Miranda and Carrie and everybody else on this call all had 100 milkweed plants, it probably wouldn't equal the number of milkweeds on, on an acre of natural habitat. And so BASF, we work with our, our farmers, our customers, and our partners to encourage them to plant more milkweed in the parts of the, the land that they're not actively using for farming, because in a place where you're not farming, it'll do no harm. And, and that number of milkweed stems being restored will contribute a lot to the monarch population. And that's really what, what the monarchs need. They, they, you know, it's cool for me to have, you know, the milkweed patch by the mailbox and always see the caterpillars. But monarchs don't need five milkweeds in our yard. They need acres and acres and acres of milkweeds and the other, you know, pollinator-friendly plants that the adults depend on for nectar so that they can make that migration. So it's a lot of things that go into that orange butterfly. Awesome. Yeah, and very cool. And I know that I have lots and lots of friends who have milkweed and they're just posting. Apparently it's a good year for monarchs. We, I've seen lots and lots of caterpillars on my Facebook feeds. And um, <laughs> so be on the lookout if you have, and, and if you have the space, if you have the sun, um, plant some milkweed plants and, and um, you know, every little bit helps. But like John said, it's great work that you guys are doing with the, um, the monarch program and encouraging farmers to use all that land um, to plant milkweed. All right, and um, speaking of butterflies, um, Bill wants to know what does the dust on like butterflies and moths? So if we touch their wings, we kind of get those little their scales, right? Can you can you talk about yeah. that? Sure. So so these are yeah. So the dust is actually if you look really closely and and, and probably. Um, if you go on Google and you 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 type in like a close-up view of a moth's wing or a butterfly's wing, you'll see that these are actually little tiny scales, right? And the insect, you know, when it becomes an adult, the outer part of that animal's exoskeleton is covered in these scales. And they do a couple things. Um, in a lot of insects, a lot of butterflies, you know, the scales function as a as a species recognition. So it helps you know, you go out to the garden or, or to the arboretum or something like this, there's a lot of different kinds of butterflies and they have to tell each other apart for, you know, all sorts of purposes, right? Defending territories, you know, finding a mate, et cetera. And so the, the scales can first and foremost, from a long distance away, tell one butterfly what the other one is, whether it's young or old, whether it's, uh, you know, a boy or a girl. Some other things that the scales do, you know, they, they function. So a lot of, in, in a lot of cases, these are sort of water resistant or water repellent. So if there's a little bit of sprinkling, you know, a little bit of precipitation, light rain, you still sometimes see some of these bigger butterflies and moths especially can still fly in that because it makes them kind of waterproof. It's like having a raincoat. Um, and then up close, more interesting stuff starts to happen. So in some cases, you know, these scales help, you know, if that animal, like think of a moth flying around at night, and that moth is going through your garden and it bumps into a spider web. Well, some of those scales will stick to the web and allow the moth to break free and keep on, you know, doing what it's doing. It probably goes, whew, thank goodness I got out of there. Um, and, and so that, you know, wears off over time, which is why I'm sure everybody's parents always tell them, you know, oh, don't touch the scales on the wings because it'll, it'll damage the animal. Yes, it will damage the animal in a way. It'll help remove those scales that would come off naturally and, and it'll make them more susceptible to spiders and predators and things like that. Maybe the coolest thing, actually going back to the monarchs, is the scales of monarch butterflies actually contain some of those nasty chemicals from the milkweed. And so when another animal tries to put the monarch in its mouth, it gets a mouthful of those scales and the scales are, you know, they taste 
likely terrible. I'm not going to volunteer to taste one because I know what's in there. Um, but maybe a Miranda will do it where we can find a, you know, somebody at the museum that would put a monarch on their tongue. But I imagine that tastes really, really bad. And so, you know, that allows the butterfly to maybe get, you know, a lizard or a bird picks it up in the mouth really quickly, gets some scales and goes, ooh, no, 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 I don't want to eat that. And then let's go with a butterfly. And so the butterfly gets away, right? That's the advantage to the butterfly is that it doesn't get to be lunch. Awesome. I didn't think there was so much to learn about the scales. <laughs> I definitely learned a lot. Thanks for well, that. that right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, before we move off of um, monarchs and butterflies, um, so I know that milkweed is has some toxicity, right? And that's where um, the monarchs get some of their toxicity from eating the milkweed. Um, and so Amber wants to know, do you know if it's toxic to dogs or other animals? You know, in, in, in a large enough quantity, milkweed is going to be toxic to most things. So, so the, there's a bunch of chemicals in milkweed that mess up the sodium pumps in your, in your nervous system. So they can make you pretty sick. But, you know, something as big as a dog or a person, you're going to have to potentially eat an awful lot of milkweed. So, for example, touching it, you know, if you have a milkweed plant in the garden and you just walk over to it to smell the flowers in the springtime, this is not likely to do anything to you. Um, it's going to make you sick to your stomach long before you can get enough of that plant into your body to, to really do some damage, right? That's why it tastes bad. It's an early warning system. It's like, uh, you know, a lot of nasty plants. You put them in your mouth and they, they don't taste good and then you stop eating them. Awesome. Yeah, it's kind of like a, we don't want you to die. We want you to learn. <laughs> Well, that's exactly right. That's why monarchs have to be the right balance of toxic, right? They have to be toxic enough that a bird puts them in their mouth once and then goes, whew, I'm not doing that again. Um, but obviously, if the bird dropped dead, then the birds wouldn't learn. And then the monarch would still be lunch. And so that's, that doesn't work. Exactly. All right. And um, speaking of the toxicity, um, um, the butterfly that mimics the monarch, and so... Um, so it doesn't get eaten? Oh, viceroys. Yes, viceroy butterflies. So this is another, this is a, an animal. Then uh, they're here in North Carolina. They're, uh, the caterpillars feed on willow trees. There's actually, I think, some evidence that they also, um, it isn't so much that viceroys themselves don't taste bad. It's that it's a case of what we call convergent evolution, meaning two species of things are, are evolving towards having one appearance so that it's actually easier to educate the birds. The, the, the viceroy caterpillars uh, may sequester uh, salicylic acid from willow trees and also are somewhat distasteful. It's a different chemical mechanism, but it's easier if you're a bird, right? If you only have to remember that orange and black bugs are bad, not that two different, completely different looking animals are bad, but it's the same principle, this convergent evolution uh, that applies to, you know, for example, the various patterns on things like bumblebees and wasps that are often black and yellow, red and yellow, red, black and yellow. This is an easy signal for things to learn. Generally speaking, if you run across something in the environment that's, you know, bright orange and black or bright yellow and black, uh, this is in most cases something that's, uh, you know, don't mess with it. Awesome. And I know we are um, running short of time, so I have two more questions. First of all, um, are you scared of any insects? Am I scared of them? Um, well, that's a good question. I don't like certain insects in large quantities. Um, so, you know, when you go outside in the woods and there are just hundreds of, you know, tabanid flies, deer flies, things like this, and they're just swarming you, they're trying to bite you, they always get you like on the ear, on the neck. Man, that, that drives me nuts. I don't, I don't appreciate that. I have a healthy respect for things that can bite me, right? So, so, you know, mosquitoes, it isn't necessarily that I'm scared of them, but I understand that a lot of mosquitoes can carry viruses. I'm not interested in getting viruses. I've had my complete capacity to hear about viruses this year. So mosquitoes are, are maybe something I will avoid. I don't run and hide from them necessarily, but I don't like them at all. Sorry to the fly theme, but I don't like mosquitoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think it's, yeah, it's probably one of those experiences, right? Like, you know, the, the deer flies and stuff like that wouldn't bother you if you had never been, you know, bitten by them. <laughs> I'd be like, okay, cool, there's some deer flies. But yeah, that's a, again, they're, they're teaching you to stay away, right? And then, uh, yeah, Carrie said she's afraid of assassin bugs and she has been um, bitten by an assassin bug. So um, I think she had a few days of, of lasting pain there. Well, you were playing with them too much then. <laughs> I, I know she, uh, 
I think most of the time hers are accidental. Like she has chickens, so she picked up a chicken the other day and it had some something that stung her on the bottom of it. So, um, but yeah, and, and then the last question that we're gonna go before we're running short on time, I don't wanna keep it too long. I know everybody, we have lots and lots of programs. They're like almost on the hour all week, but I kind of, you know, put this question in the, in the tease in the description and it is, um, so do you raise bed bugs and how do you feed them, John? How do you feed a bed bug? Because I know what bed bugs like to eat, why they're hanging out in, in beds. <laughs> yeah, so, so we, we, do raise, we do raise bed bugs. Um, these are important, uh, you know, to our PNSS colleagues. Um, and how do we feed them? So we all know that bed bugs, you know, eat blood. So, you know, we, we Potentially, you know, you gotta you gotta be real careful because if you you know you're one of the colleagues that maybe gets on my bad side, I might volunteer you for the bed bug feeding. But no, really, we don't we don't use we don't use the coworkers as much as it might be tempting in some cases. Uh, we actually feed them on uh, rabbit blood that is bought from a supply house that works you know with immunology types of assays or or, or these types of laboratory tests. So no harm will come to any of my my coworkers or Miranda or Carrie or anybody else. We don't feed them bed bugs. Something though maybe in some case. So do they just um will they just kind of drink it out of a dish or do you have like a special like skin like <laughs> Yeah, there's a there's a method that goes behind this, right? You don't just pour blood in a dish and they, they drink it like, you know, Count Dracula or something like this. There's a whole whole process that goes into it. It's pretty complicated actually. They're one of the harder ones to feed. Yeah, I know I talked to a, an entomologist once who um they were able to raise body lice in their lab, but like head lice, they couldn't, they couldn't do. They were like, the only thing we can think of is that we'd actually have to like, you know, let them feed off of us and, you know, nobody's up for, up for that. So. <laughs> yeah, that's short straw sounds like. Yeah. So, um, so interesting. And, and John, I thank you so much for, um, for joining us today, for, you know, putting together your presentation. Um, if anybody, like has any more questions, you can always um, send them to us at the museum and we can get them to John and I'm sure he'd be happy to answer answer them, you know, with limitations. He has a lot of work to do. He stays busy raising those millions and millions and possibly a billion bugs, who knows how many. And um, we'll get there. Yeah, and you know, we, like Carrie says, she, you know, thank you so much for your passion for arthropods. Um, and, you know, I love to, your story about how you've always known that you, we're interested in, in insects, you know, from the time you were little. And I think a lot of us, you know, have always had um, something that we were interested in, but maybe we didn't know that we were going to be an entomologist when we were, you know, yay big. So um, thanks again. And um, I really appreciate it so much. And everyone, thank you so much for coming. Um, I hope you had fun. I hope you learned a ton, just like me. And of course, we have a week of programs. Go to bugfest.org check them all out. And of course, if you are like me, you have to get a Bugfest shirt every single year. We're, those are available on bugfest.org. I know John's going to get one. Um, and so we are so excited about them. They have all these flies. So it's a virtual infestation. Um, and again, you know, if you really enjoyed the program, we'd love for you to donate to the museum to help support more programs like this as we go throughout the year and into next year. And um, we hope to see you at our future events here um, during Bug Fest. I know if you are not as into mosquitoes as John and I are, we have a presentation at two o'clock that is talking about how to keep them kind of out of our yards and away from us and off of us. So um, thank you so much. Thanks again, John. All right, take care everybody. Enjoy the rest of Bug Fest. <laughs>